All right. Well, Sophie, welcome to the show and a reminder to our guests and our audience for the Rep Podcast, specifically the How I Sell segment. We ask our guests the same five questions to get that apples to apples comparison across the entire guest. But Sophie, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you, happy to have you. So your career is illustrious and we want to dig in and figure out why and how you got to where you are. So if you're ready, uh, I would love to ask you the first of the five questions. I'm ready, let's do it. Amazing, all right. Well, what is the best investment an early career salesperson can do for themselves and why? Yeah, so I would say two major kind of themes came up for me when I thought about this question. So the first I would say is investing in building your skill set. So if you're just starting out in your career, think about the the jobs and also the companies that will teach you about the tangible things that you need to know and that will make you an asset, not just today, but also, you know, 10 years, 15 years down the line and in your career. So really thinking less about, you know, the title or what the the view of a job might be, but really what that job is, is going to teach you. So, you know, our CRO at Box often talks about this, like having a tool belt and that every role that you, that you take on, you learn how to use like a new tool. And I just love that analogy. So I guess invest in a tool belt, add more tools as you go through your, your career. And then the second one I thought about is just investment in relationships. So, you know, ultimately we're all people and people want to work with people they like, they trust. So just spending that time early on building the brand that you want to be known for and getting to know people deeply, caring about them, care, you know, if they, if you care for them, they'll care for you. And I just think that will make your job more fulfilling, but it also gives you these lifelong mentors and, and friends and and that's just invaluable in your career long term yeah both are both are really great and often not talked about enough especially when you're entering in your career right you have all this anxiety like how am i gonna do yeah. how am i gonna perform am i gonna impress the right people and really it's just those two simple things are are what carry a lot of folks through like optimize for learning skills that will impact your career and, and then optimize for relationships. I've got two, two, two questions off that. The first is on the last part, the relationships part. So when you're in a formal setting or when you're in a business setting, oftentimes you feel like you have to put on, you know, a persona or play a different role. Like how do you develop those relationships without coming off like n not genuine or like a professional trying to be a professional person? Yeah. And, and you have to really want to have that engagement and that relationship with the person. Otherwise it's not genuine. Right. So the advice is not go into your company and just do a checklist of getting to know X, Y, Z person, but it's really just figuring out, you know, like who am I drawn to at this company and why, and what can they teach me? And I think that, you know, part of coming into the professional world, it's really tough to, sometimes you pretend to be somebody you're not, or you sort of put on this air. And, you know, one of the things that I've always tried to do is my work professional self, my work professional Sophie is the same as my, my kind of personal life Sophie, how my friends know me, how my partner knows me, how you know, my family knows me. And I think that is a big part of it is be yourself because you have a ton of value to bring. And that's, what's going to get you those relationships because people are going to see it. If you're just trying to, you know, create a artificial relationship to help your career. So really just be genuine and, and find out what people are about and listen, listen to people like active listening and and learning about them when, when they're talking and telling you things about their, especially their personal life. Yeah. Such a, such a good way to, to draw it up. And a lot of it kind of reminds me of the same advice that I would give an early career sales professional, which is find your own voice, right? Find who you are and really understand how to find your own style and your own cadence, not try to be a smooth talker. If you're more introverted, that's totally cool. Play your role, try to be, you know, try to find where you excel and, and just, and go with that. And then the, the second question I had off of, 
off of your first answer was, let's say you're an early career professional. You don't exactly know what skills would be important later in that career. You know, how do you identify when you're an early career? Like, what should I, what should I learn? How do I learn, you know, where am I falling short or where am I excelling and where do I double down? Yeah, great, great question. So I think the best thing you can do is talk to people who are, who have been in that role or in roles that are coming down the line and ask them, you know, so if you're coming in as an SDR, an OBR, or maybe an SMB type AE, you know, go and build those relationships with mid-market reps, enterprise reps, VPs in the, in the sales org and ask them, you know, they'll, they'll tell you they, they've been a ton of development of those types of, of reps that are moving up and moving through their career. So just asking them, what are the things, what are the tangible things? And then I think also, you know, there's a lot of ways you can get that information by reading. So one of the best books I've actually read recently is The Qualified Sales Leader. And it is more of a leadership book, but when I was reading it, I was thinking, man, I wish I'd had this when I was an AE because it really teaches you what are those skills that, that I need to know. And it, it talks through medic. And it, but in a very digestible way. And I just think that's something else that, that you can do. But yeah, ask people, go talk to the people who are in that role that you want to be in, you know, 10 years down the line and then make a list and start working on those skills. That's really cool. And you laid it out in a very simple way. And I can, I can see why you're, you know, a great leader is you just, you just made a very difficult and challenging concept, really simple, right? Just, just go talk to folks who've done it before and ask them and write it down. So it's, it's as simple as that sometimes. And, you know, it, it, it does remind me also of my first role as an individual contributor. The first time I picked up a phone was at Groupon and we spent probably two weeks sitting by top sales people who are in seats and doing it way differently or way better. And I have to say, like, I probably sat by 10, 15 folks in that first two week period and not one person did it the same. And then when you sit by those folks also, or when I sat by those folks, somebody would always be like, oh, this person does it really, really well. So it's a, it's a good way to, to figure out what other folks are pulling from even you know, different books as well. So you pick up a ton of skills along the way. I love that. Nice guidance there. Question two, how has your view on sales changed over your career? And why do you think that's happened? Yeah, I think the, the first thing I would say is it's changed very dramatically. So just to, to give some, some context on my career. So I never thought I would get into sales. I didn't go, I mean, at the time, I don't even think there was such a thing as going to school for, for sales, but there is now, but it, this was not the career path that I thought my career was going to take. So my degree is in political science. And I thought, you know, I was going to end up working for the UN, helping solve some big world problems and it didn't end up that way. So when I ended up in, in a sales role, the, the first kind of view that I had of sales was the like Glenn Ross always be closing type, type of view. ABC. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> ABC, everybody knows that. And I was like, okay, that's what sales is. That's what I'm going to be doing. It's about getting a deal done. And I realized, you know, pretty quickly. So I was in customer service right before I, I got into sales and I, I just, I was so surprised to learn the roles were so similar. Like the functions were truly pretty, pretty alike because it was not about always be closing. It was really not about that at all. You know, if you're closing all the time, you're missing out on all the, the things that you truly should be doing. So it's about the customer. It's about their success. And if everything you do is about making your customer successful, then, then you're going to be successful as an AE. So, you know, kind of thinking about like the end game is not getting the contract signed, but it's truly like, what is the, what is your product going to do for your customer? What's the positive outcome that they're going to see? So I think that was a very big shift, you know, in my, in my view early on. And then I think later, you know, in the past few years, it, it, my view has changed a little bit just because I feel like sales has gotten more and more complex. So the act of of selling has become, it, it's a, a hard thing to do. And I think a lot of, you know, the traditional view on a sales career is like, oh, it's not that high caliber maybe. And I just luckily think that's really changing. And, you know, the, the biggest view shift for me has been what you're solving is actually really challenging, complex problems within these organizations. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we're doing in automation, like at Box, we have a great online sales, you know, funnel 
But actually, the more we're getting automated and the more customers are buying through that medium, the value of a salesperson actually increases because it's the consultative part, the part that, you know, only a human can do, which is take a look at a problem and, and come up with creative, unique solutions. So that's what I love about it. And I think that's like a big shift in my perspective and view of the, of the, of the sales role. Yeah, that's a, it's a good. It's a good one. It's been called out a few times. I've seen it for sure. I didn't imagine myself getting into sales as well. I, you know, I, I went to a, a business school and got an undergraduate business school and got a degree in finance. And I thought, you know, I banking is for me and yeah. ended up graduating into the, uh, the 2009 crash. So I was like, okay, what, what's next? But yeah. frankly, you know, all I knew about sales or sales people was the same thing that you saw, right? The Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross or Boiler Room had just, had just come out. And now more recently, like Wolf of Wall Street, it's the same themes. And you probably, you know, Hollywood paints a, a picture of it. You probably see the same stuff. You probably remember that one friend who was very loud and boisterous and went into sales or, you know, the athlete that went into sales and it just is not. It's not true. It's not what the world looks like. And it's not what sales looks like today at all. And I think it's shifting even further away from that. It's really well thought out value propositions, empathetic sales, driving towards commonality and actually being helpful. And I think as tech has gone on and as SaaS companies and B2B sales has grown, you're seeing a lot more of the like self self selection. So folks know pretty much what they want. They can educate themselves quite, quite aggressively before they get to that sales arm of a company. And, and I think that's a net positive you really have to be more strategic on the, on the selling side as well. Yeah. Agreed. Awesome. Well, uh, moving on to question three, and this is, uh, this is a tough one typically for folks, but I, you know, but it, but it's a, it's a great one as well, especially for our early career audience. But what is one, uh, one mistake you made early in your career that has shaped the way that you operate today and how has it shaped you? Yeah, I, I love this question. I, I know it's a tough one, but I, I talk to my team a lot about failure and mistakes. And one of our company values is actually fail fast. So I feel like we're very transparent about this and, and it's almost something that we encourage. And I mean, yeah, it is incredibly, of course, humbling to look back on mistakes as well, but I just view it as more of an area of, of growth. And if you're not making mistakes, then you're probably not taking enough risk. But so two mistakes come to mind for me. And again, there's probably plenty more to, to choose from. But I think the first one is I had this mindset early on in my career that you have to check like 100% of qualifications for, for a role. And the, the second piece of that is not asking for what you truly want to achieve or, or do. And those go hand in hand for sure. But early on in my career, I think I just had the impression like, oh, everybody who's, you know, being an AE is 100% qualified or everybody who's a manager is 100% qualified and, and they know exactly what, what they're doing. And it wasn't until I had a really, you know, form this relationship with a mentor and had a few years of experience that I realized actually very few people are 100% qualified for, for anything. and you really shouldn't be actually, because when you're going for a new role, there should always be that area of growth. So I think the idea of stretching and growing into a role really got on my radar a little bit later than I would have liked. And then the second one is not being shy to give people visibility into that North Star goal that you have. So, you know, I think early on in my career, I felt really sort of embarrassed about saying the ambitious goals that I had, like, oh, I can never be, you know, a CRO one day. And it's like, well, why, why not? So why do you feel like that's something that you can't be? So I think making, you know, aspirations known and I just didn't do that. And I, I feel like it's really, you know, I try to encourage the young sellers on my team to really do that because it's something that I saw in myself and I realized, you know, there was a few stumbling blocks in my career because of that. So really talking about what you want is a, a really great way to start working toward what it is that you want. That is really strong advice. And frankly, I, I, well, I'm, I'm fully biased now, but I felt the same <laughs> way about experience, right? The, there's like this weird thing happening or that happened in the past where all these early career roles or early career jobs 
or positions at different companies state like, yes, you need one to five years experience to get into the role. Like, how does that make sense at all? That That's just not, it's not fair. It's not how the world works really. Like, I mean, I'm building, building a company that solving that issue, but at Ramped, we fundamentally believe that skills are the new currency, not experience, right? And skills can be acquired by anybody. It's all you have to do is, you know, you, you probably have to be somewhat of a fit personality wise for some roles, but you can also acquire them. And if you think you really want to get into sales and you're hungry and you're determined, but you just don't have that, you know, the, the hard skills yet, you don't know how to cold call or you don't know how to send emails. Like you can learn all of those things. And it doesn't matter if you have a two years working as a real estate agent or as a BDR to be a great BDR, you can, yeah. you can acquire skills and be a great BDR. You just have to you know, work at it. So I, I totally feel that the, the, the other thing that you said, something that I was, I, I never did my first role really ever until I, I kind of like snapped out of it one day, I think mostly out of frustration because like, it wasn't, I wasn't getting to where I, I knew I could be or what I wanted. And I just realized ne more like retrospectively, but I didn't say it enough. I didn't tell my boss or the folks that I worked with, like, Hey, I really want to manage. I really want to lead. I really want to grow a team. I just kind of thought that it would happen because I did well. So it just, somebody else would notice, but you really have to take control of your own career path. And it is on you to tell your manager, tell the leaders at your org, and then, you know, see how they respond. If they respond negatively and you're doing well, that's, that's a, that's a, a piece of info that you can take, or if they respond really positively and they enable you and carve out a specific plan and help you get there again, you're probably in the right spot. And there's, there's two ways to look at it. And it's it, either way, it's feedback for you. Yeah. And to your point about how do you know what skills, if you're not talking to people about what you want to do, you can't get that feedback of like, well, here are the areas. If, if the answer is, I don't think you're ready for that role. Okay, great. Tell me why, what are the things that I need to work on? And then you're given, you know, development opportunities. So. Yeah, I just think sometimes we we hold ourselves back and I definitely feel like, you know, I did that and this idea of work really hard, people will notice you. That's true to some extent. I mean, you have to be good at your job if you want to keep moving forward, but I just really feel strongly that you have to also advocate for yourself. And it can be it can be challenging to do, but I think it's really important. It's really really important, and I'm really glad you said it. I have a tactical question. So let's say you're somebody early in your career, hypothetically, who has a big ambition, if, even if sales or otherwise, but has a big ambition to grow into leadership and then ultimately mature into senior leadership. How do you have those conversations? What's the right way to have a conversation with your manager or, or a leader to set that up so that you are on that track? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing you should always think about is like, how do I form a good relationship with my direct manager, with the, the leadership that I have, right? So that's super important. I think it's really key to think about ways that you can reach out to leaders that are not just your immediate manager, but above you. And obviously you have to be respectful of their time, but reaching out and asking, hey, is it okay if we have, you know, a standing quarterly or, or monthly or whatever the right cadence is for, for your organization? meeting because I want to pick your brain. So I think you start with saying, you know, like you're the COO. I am very early in my career, but I aspire to be a COO in, you know, 15 years. And I want to know how you got there. Like, tell me, you know, your career path. I want to learn what are the things I should be thinking about right now so that I can end up in your shoes one day. And I've never met a C-suite leader who's not open to that. I just think that that, you know, what an amazing thing to have somebody who's early in their career come to you and say, I want to be you. Like, that's amazing. And I have, you know, there's people on my team who say that in like a few years, I want to be you. I'm like, great. I can't wait to see you take my job. Like, fantastic. Let me tell you, you know, my path to get there. And here are the things that I would do if I were you. And if I had the hindsight, this is what I would be doing. And I just, I just think people who, who hear that, like, I want to be in your shoes. They want to guide you. Like people want to help you get where you are. Yeah. I think that's the, well, one, one 
it's very tactical and I think folks will, will love this one. But two, I think generally speaking, if you reach out to somebody for help, the most times are like, you know, one, one, picture yourself as that person. It's very flattering and it's very, it means a lot. Like not, you don't, you don't hear that about yourself every day. And that that's, it's just, they're just people just like you. They have the same emotions. They, you know, like to feel, feel good. And I think that's a feel good way to approach them and build a relationship. So that's, that, that, that's, uh, that's really great guidance. Question number four, who has had the greatest impact on your career? And uh, if you could expand upon it as well, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I think the question is very hard and it's hard because I've been so lucky to have so many people. So narrowing it down <laughs> was really tough for me, but there's two people that really come up. So one is Kelly Bray. She's now a VP over at Slack. She was my first manager at Box. So she was the one who hired me. So somebody who took a chance on me very early in my career. I, I came into Box in 2012 and she was the person who really took the chance on me to get into leadership. So I moved from an IC role to a manager role under her, and it just has changed the whole path of, of my career. So she really helped me build the confidence of that, what I was talking about. I really didn't feel 100% ready for the role, but she just gave me that confidence that, you know, she was taking a chance on me and that she saw the potential in me to grow into a role that, you know, I wasn't necessarily 100% ready for. And then the other person is that uh, Karina Brockle, who's uh, now a VP over at Aurora Solar. And I, you know, a, a bit of a, again, humbling thing I'll share, but I just gone through what I viewed as a pretty big setback in my career at, at Box. I was overlooked for a director role and I just was really at a crossroads of how to handle the rejection. And I was debating. Do I move on from Box? Is this my time to leave the company? Is it time to go in a new direction? And Karina was somebody I'd met. I was fortunate enough to work a year in London for Box. So I'd met her over there and she had relocated to the US and was running our emerging sales team. And I was a manager on the enterprise side at the time. And I always just viewed, you know, Karina had always looked up to her. I, I knew everybody who worked for her loved her and they grew so much as luck would have it. And sometimes you need a little bit of luck in your career, a, a leadership role opened up on her team. So decided to go for that role and, and got it. And it was, you know, a bit of a lateral move because I was a frontline manager in, in enterprise and I moved to frontline and, and emerging and I really did it to build my, my skill set. So I hadn't worked with the very small customers. And so that was a, a big part of it, but it was just the best decision I could have made. She, she's been a true champion for me since that first day that I was on her team. And, you know, again, she championed me for roles. I, I really didn't have the confidence to, to go for without her support. And even to this day, she's, you know, we'll meet up for lunch or, or dinner because we're great friends now as well. But She's always asking me, well, like, well, what more are you doing? And what else are you asking for? Are you taking over another segment? And don't you want to do more? And I just think having, you know, strong leaders like that who are building you up and challenging you and, and really championing you, I just, I, I feel like, I feel very strongly that it would have taken me a lot longer to get to this place in, in my career if I didn't have people like Kelly and, and Karina that I'd met. It's awesome. Those are, those are great. And I think if I could paraphrase some of the threads or some of the things that you said, so the, the thing that stood out the most is that great folks or great mentors or advisors to you in your career, not only champion you and cheer you on, but they also challenge you to think a little bit more critically and step outside your comfort zone. And then two is a reframing of perspective just based on their experiences. So, you know, it looked like that setback turned into a really cool opportunity and a risk that you could take and it puts you in, a, you know, the position you're in now, which is sounds like on track for where you want to be in, in a few years too, for, for the rest of your career, which is really cool. Yeah. And I think that, you know, and I have conversations with people at my current company and just, you know, people who have maybe gone for a role that they didn't get. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people react to that by maybe leaving the company and everybody has to decide for themselves. Right. But I do think it's important to think about the setback and am I doing this out of pride? Like if, because I didn't get a role, I now have to leave the company or am I truly doing it because I feel like I've hit a, a plateau and 
I, I had to be pretty honest with myself and say, like, I don't think I'm done at this company. I just think this wasn't, you know, it just wasn't the role for me. And, and honestly, now looking back, I'm like, so grateful they didn't give me that role because I was not, you know, there's a difference between stretch and being like, I'm not ready for that. And that was not a stretch for me. It wasn't, I'm not ready. And I just didn't really see it until later. So when I went into this other role and really, you know, gained a lot of skills by the time I was in a position to get to second line, I felt so much more confident and I still felt like it was a stretch, but I knew that I had enough of the foundation to get there. That's great. And thanks so much for sharing and uh, going a layer deeper with this one. Really appreciate it. Last question. And we ask all our guests, all three seasons, one, one of reflection, but if you could go back in time, now that you have the benefit of hindsight and give Sophie coming out of school or approaching that first career, some piece of advice, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, it's, it's a really tough one because I think even, you know, I've kind of mentioned this a few times now, but like mistakes and failures really get you to, to the point where you are. So I, I think it's tough to go back and, and do it, but I, I would give myself just a little more of a confidence boost in, in telling myself, like, everybody is figuring it out. Like your manager, your VP, your C-level, everybody is human. I think you mentioned that as well. And, and everybody has areas of development and growth and things that they're working on. And I just feel like I spent too much of my career in the beginning, not being confident in myself and, and that imposter feeling and, and feeling like that was unique and it really truly isn't. And that feeling just holds you back. So I think I would just tell myself like it, it's less advice, but more almost like a, like a, like a pep talk, I guess, but realize that everybody is figuring it out. No one's perfect. And then the other thing I would say is double down on what makes you unique. Don't shortchange who you are because that brings such value and just be, be yourself because that is, you're unique and nobody else is, is like you. And that's like it's a huge value to bring to a company. And I just feel like I, I wish somebody had told me those things because I, it probably would have just made my career a little bit easier. Like be a little bit nicer to yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's really good advice. So hard to execute early in your career too, because you're just trying to figure it out and you have so many things that you're worried about and really it just comes down to, you know, believing in yourself, trusting yourself, know that you were put in the spot you were put in for some reason. Like you, you got the role that you got because somebody believed in you and just have faith in that and have confidence in that. It's so, so hard to execute when you're, when you're that early stage. It's just, it just, I don't know why it is. It just is. It is. It's very hard. And I think that's where the like relationship and the mentorships come into you of having people who are maybe beyond your years or at least beyond your experience level, you know, telling you and sharing their stories. I'm really developing relationships where people will tell you like, Hey, I get nervous when I get on stage and I've been doing this for 10 years. You're just hearing those things really help me. Cause I'm like, oh, okay. I thought it was just me that had this problem. I thought I was alone in this. So the more you have those people around you that you can talk to about those types of things that helps, but yeah, it is tough. I, it's not an easy one, but maybe it'll help a few people hearing that. That's great. And a, a really nice way to end the discussion. Well, Sophie, this has been, this has been phenomenal. Where can folks find you? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the, the best way. Just send me a message or I'm just Sophie at box.com. So you can send an email there too. But yeah, Danny, thank you so much. It was great chatting with you. You're a great host. Ah, thanks so much. Really appreciate that. And yeah, from the, the legendary Sophie at box, we will see you all on the next episode. Thanks so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.